for the final time today. It's encouraging to see so many familiar faces from this morning's session. So uh, thanks very much for staying with us. Time now to hand over to Cathy Scott. Cathy will be explaining how the climate change emergency is a health emergency. We won't solve it by doing the same things we're doing now. Innovation, of course, plays a key role in supporting the move to net zero, and the AHSN network supports the faster adoption of innovation in the NHS. So, Cathy, I'd like to hand you over to the virtual stage. It's all yours. Thank you, Thank you very much, Helen. Um, hopefully you can all hear me, but I'm sure somebody will say something. I'm Cathy Scott, as Helen said. I'm Cathy. No, it's not yet, is it? It doesn't say So I'll carry on with my little blurb about me. Um, so I'm Cathy Scott, I'm Deputy Chief Exec for the Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network. Um, we're one of 15 AHSMs in England. And in addition to being the Deputy Chief Exec, I lead on environmental sustainability for the network as a whole. And I'm here today because I want to tell you why I think innovation is vitally important in helping the NHS to reach net zero. Um, just, can I just ask whether the presentation is um, is up now? No problem, thank you. I'm being told that the presentation will be up in a few minutes and I'm sure you, you can hardly wait. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say that I know that everybody here is convinced that the NHS needs to contribute to net zero or else you wouldn't be here. So my apologies for, for saying what you already know. Lovely, thank you. If we could just move to slide two. Excellent, thank you. So this agenda is so important to health. Uh, you'll be aware that the climate change um, will affect us all in multiple ways, and that includes our health and well-being. So as a result of climate change, we can expect to see increases in cardiovascular illness, in respiratory disease, in mental ill health um, and increased incidence of tropical diseases. And that's in addition to illnesses from poor water quality and impact of civil conflicts. This slide really sums it up. This slide is from the CDC in the USA. So a climate change emergency is a health emergency. So moving on to the next slide, if you do things the same way that you've always done them, you'll get the same outcomes we've always got. So we know this, we have to do things differently. Next slide. And the NHS is doing things differently. So for those of you who are able to attend the last session, you've got to hear some of the great stuff that's happening around anaesthetic gases and um, inhaler gases. Uh, it's really encouraging. In addition to, to those things, so the Royal Brompton Hospital in London is um, sends zero waste to landfill every year and has been doing that for some years now, or failing to do that for some years now. Newcastle upon Tyne hospitals has reduced their carbon footprint from visitor and patient travel by 32% through um, virtual uh, outpatient appointments. That's over 375,000 appointments. Approximately 7 million miles has been saved and almost 2,000 tonnes of carbon. Uh, lots of hospitals have done this. The two that I know of are Bradford and Harrogate, and they have eradicated use of des desfluorane from their anaesthetic, uh, from their operating theatres. We heard earlier about the harm that these gases do to the environment. And Great Ormond Street Hospital has reduced the use of single plastic, uh, single use plastic gloves and saved 21 tonnes of plastic. So there's some really great stuff going on. So to me, and I'm not alone in this, next slide please. Innovation is doing something new and different, or it can be using something that already exists in new and different ways. So in the NHS, we see innovation in new drugs, technologies, pathways, but we also see existing medications and ways of delivering healthcare um, being used in, in new ways. So for example, repurposing drugs for conditions other than the ones they were originally developed for. Uh, one example from Scotland uses an innovation that films babies in an ICU uh, to send to, to patients when they weren't actually in the hospital. And a new, a new resurgent has flipped the model for epilepsy. So filming children um, out of hospital showing suspected fits. And this has massively sped up and improved care and spread across Scotland. What I would say is that coming up with new ideas is easy. 
Um, even getting the development of new things is relatively easy. Relatively speaking, there's plenty of money sloshing around to develop your prototype. But getting wide scale adoption of innovation is really hard. And there are a number of, of reasons why you know, change is difficult. Um, there's no time, there's not invented here syndrome, complex pathways, organizational inertia, lack of funding, lack of expertise. And all of this is especially true in the NHS. And that's why AHSNs exist. Thank you. So there are 15 AHSNs located across England. We have a clear focus on the spread and adoption of, of health innovation, increasing economic growth and improving outcomes for patients. So while individual AHSNs operate on a local and regional level, so we're all connected into our local organisations, fundamentally we operate as one large national network that is interconnected, a network of networks, and we work together to spread insights, learnings and innovation. As an organisation, all AHSNs are about the spread of adoption. Uh, we share our learning around what the needs are and what, around what works and how we deliver it. So it, that means that we're quickly able to identify and spread potential solutions. And our work is successful. In 2021, our spread and adoption programmes benefited over 400,000 patients. And we leveraged £462 million of investment into our local areas. And we created 700 jobs. But I've got some examples of how what we do has helped um, reduce the harm that healthcare can do to the environment, but I'll come to those in a bit. We're able to achieve these impacts because we share a set of national commissioners and a set of priorities. So I'm not going to go through them all, but they're around adoption and spread, support for the life sciences industry, and that includes SMEs and individual innovators. Our local economic growth, identifying and promoting new technologies like um, artificial intelligence and robotic process automation, and supporting research and evaluation to make sure that promising innovations are evidence-based. And most recently, we share a priority around the Green NHS agenda. So what are we doing? Um, we formed a network community of interest last year. So that's a group of people who obviously are passionate about this agenda. Uh, we developed a strategy that sets out our four areas of activity. So the first one is obvious, we reduce our own carbon footprint as every business should be doing. Um, where we are supporting innovations already, we're working with the innovators and the companies to encourage them to think green. How can they reduce the harm that their innovation has? And we're looking for innovations that specifically address this area and looking at how we can spread, uh, improve spread and adoption into the NHS. And finally, we're looking to spread good practice and brokering relationships from other industries into the NHS and vice versa, where the NHS, and it does have a lot, where it has something that can benefit other places. And we, we hope that these will enable us to build a movement by sharing best practice across the HSN network and the NHS and wider. Um, we, we are working with innovators, products and services to reduce the environmental harm caused by healthcare. We want to influence policy. So for example, um, getting the uptake of environmental sustainable innovations more quickly into the NHS through the supply chain. And we're calculating the impact of our programmes so that the NHS and the people who make the policy can see the difference that it can make if you do something differently. So what does this mean in practice? Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so HSNs are supporting the development of spread and innovations that make a difference. I've already said that several times. So as an example, Wessex AHSN is supporting the multicath trial. And that's looking at whether being able to clean and reuse catheters is safe for the patient. Being able to reuse PVC catheters would reduce waste massively. So currently over 100 million catheters are thrown away every year in the UK. Next slide, please. As well as working with research and academic colleagues, we also work with industry and procurement specialists. So during the pandemic, we worked with all health partners, uh, care organisations, local trusts in the region to understand the, the level of need for different PPE items and where the gaps were. And we engaged with innovators to see whether um, they could fill those gaps. And we've already heard today about the fact that single PPE has a massive, it creates a massive amount of waste. So we brought together a group of relevant NHS leaders and industry experts to share knowledge around alternative sources and scope for reprocessing. We supported trusts and innovators in securing commercial agreements, um, 
facilities, expertise, testing, evaluation for several innovations that address these issues. So these included Oxford, supporting a way of decontaminating PPE equipment. We sped up the approvals for Perso, the personal respirator hood. Uh, this was Wessex AHSN and got this product into the supply chain twice as quickly as might have happened without our engagement. And we've been supporting work, a few of the AHSNs have been supporting work with um, Department for Health and Social Care and NHS England colleagues around development of reusable PPE. And initial pilots have shown that um, reusable PPE is not only welcomed by staff, but it saves money. So an average cost saving in the region of £1.50 per use based on 75 washes and including laundry costs. Um, it reduces energy use, so 28% less energy, 41% less water is used, 66% fewer emissions are needed uh, or generated in the production and laundering of a reusable gown compared to the equivalent number of disposable gowns. Next slide, please. And when it comes to market ready products, we support the adoption and wider spread of these. So we worked with trusts in England to roll out um, the placental growth factor diagnostic tests. So these rule out preeclampsia in pregnant women. And that means that only those women with the disease, with the condition, actually need to stay in hospital. So that's not only better for, for the mother and baby, because obviously you want to be at home with your family, um, but it reduces the number of bed days needed and other associated consumables, which all impact on um, carbon emissions. So as a network, we estimate that we saved over a thousand tonnes of car carbon by implementing this over the last 18 months. Thank you. And we've also been supporting the rollout of virtual wards and virtual monitoring devices. So these innovations mean that people are using special kit. It can take blood pressure readings, it can look in your ears, your eyes, um, and it send the results back to the clinician for review and appropriate treatment. We facilitated the rollout of the COVID Oximetry at Home programme, which allowed patients with COVID to monitor their oxygen levels at home and only be brought into the hospital when needed. And we're supporting tighter care in West Yorkshire and Harrogate, which can be used in a variety of settings, including care homes, children's services and accident and emergency. And these innovations reduce the need for travel to and from the hospital and can also reduce, reduce the physical footprint um, needed for clinics as well as consumables. Um, in Yorkshire and Humber HSN, we've been working closely with our ICSs and we've been funded by West Yorkshire ICS to develop a proof of concept accelerator. So it provides bespoke, bespoke support for initially three innovations to consider the impact that they have on the environment and how to make their innovations greener. So products on Propel at YNH Net Zero include Automedi, which is a point of care 3D printer which uses recyclable thermoplastics. So it sits in your hospital, in your pharmacy, wherever. You punch in a code of the thing that you need from your catalogue. It prints the thing that you need out for you. And what I particularly like is that when you've, you've done the thing that you need, you put it back into the machine and it's used as, as um, fuel for something else. So that reduces the need for, for delivery, story. We're supporting Dignio, which is a virtual ward, virtual monitoring platform, like the, the ones I mentioned earlier. So that reduces the need for care in a face-to-face -face setting and patients know best a personal health record platform which supports sorry supports patient activation through for example a library of resources uh, digital communications and again reduces that need to come into the hospital and finally we're running a series of sharing and learning events so these bring together NHS staff colleagues from um, industry from the voluntary community and social enterprise sector city regions, local authorities, um, to learn from the journey of others. So our first event was held on the 23rd of June. James Dixon very kindly came along and talked to, he's from Newcastle upon Tyne Hospitals, and he talked about his last 10 years as a sustainability lead, what he'd learned and how he'd, he'd overcome the barriers that faced him, how he contributed to the green journey of that hospital. And what was incredibly encouraging and exactly what we wanted to see was the amount of conversation that went on in the chat and um, people saying the problems that they were having, other people coming up with solutions, sharing their best practice, their, their, their documents, their, their ways forward. And, and that was fantastic to see. So the next event is on the 28th of September and we'll be hearing from hospitals who've stopped using um, desflurane and nitrous oxide in their surgeries and maternity settings, how they've done that and what they learned from it. So if you enjoyed the previous session, please do sign up to this one. 
So what next? So as I've mentioned, we're all working with our local NHS organisations to support them in delivering on their green commitments. We've seen huge interest from the pharmaceutical and health tech injuries in this space, and many companies are keen to work in partnership with the NHS. Um, so we're working with our industry and innovation partners to develop and test new products. For example, products that um, pilots that reduce the emissions from asthma inhalers. Again, we heard about that earlier and the fact that it has such a big impact just for one medicine on the environment. And we're keen to explore how we can work in partnership with other groups and organisations. So if you're interested in working with the HSM network, please do get in touch with me. Um, so I hope that sets out why innovation is so important to this agenda. We have to work differently because if we don't, we'll just get the same results. We have to do different things. We can't carry on as we are. Otherwise, we'll just get what we have now. Thank you very much. Cathy, I think it was really clear why innovation is so important to the agenda. And uh, thank you very much indeed. I think the audience is really engaged with helping reduce things like plastic use and carbon emission through innovation, supported by the AHSN network. And of course, while still supporting better patient outcomes. So really good to have you with us. We're going to move on right now to our final panel discussion of the day, innovation appropriately and offsetting. The NHS is continually looking at reducing its carbon footprint through research and innovation in a bid to offset carbon and other greenhouse gases produced in the running of healthcare for the nation. We're here to look at areas in need of innovation and innovative solutions. I'm delighted to say I've been joined by Dr. Matthew Sawyer, GP and member of the RCGP Climate Emergency Working Group, Dan Wright, Head of Sustainability, Kent Community Health NHS Foundation Trust, and Fiona Adshead, Chair of the Sustainable Healthcare Coalition. You know the drill by now. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the Q&A area on the right-hand side of your screen. So uh, very well welcome to all my panellists. And I'd love to start off by asking all of you, perhaps kicking off with Fiona, if that's okay, what areas that you all see as being critical to carbon reduction across the NHS? Well, I think we've already heard quite a lot from um, Kerry why it's so important. I mean, I think the first thing I would say is that we, we need to focus on what's really happening in practical service delivery. When we were established as a coalition, we were formed because the NHS at the time realised that medicines and devices were probably about two thirds of that footprint at that time. And they wanted to bring people together across sectors to really collaborate and innovate. And that was why we came up with the first carbon footprinting of devices and medicines and then the kind of pathway approach. We've learned a lot from that. And I think what we've learned is that you need to work with people who are really trying to solve problems in services. So, um, you know, we've already heard a lot around how the HSNs are doing a lot of work there. I think there are huge opportunities to work with them. We've been doing that with the Oxford AHSM on their preeclampsia testing that you heard about, bringing our care pathways approach to that. But I think it's also really important to think around how we demonstrate impact. So that's why we've been thinking around opportunities to use our care pathway calculator and other approaches to really demonstrate impact. Because I think there's one thing about knowing that digital and other things can enable people to make a difference. There's another to actually quantify what that means. And I would finally go on to say that, you know, you heard about the innovations that patients know best have been doing. Um, we work closely with them to quantify what they're doing around demonstrating that digital approaches, virtual appointments can reduce impact. But I think the next stage that we'll be moving into is really thinking about how we engage patients in the conversation around how we reduce carbon footprint. So we're very keen on doing that. And we've been talking to the British Lung Foundation, ASCII UK and others around how we can bring the patient voice in. And in our recent work in Newcastle on their renal care pathways, it was great to have a renal patient involved. And he was an engineer by background and he just brought a totally different perspective to the whole conversation because he understood actually a lot about sustainability and processes that most of us in the health service didn't do. So we think of patients as people who are passive often in the system, but actually I think they can bring a huge amount and they're often a driver for wanting more sustainable services. So I guess those are a few thoughts around innovation and what we've done. 
there's some great thoughts, Fiona, to kick us off. But uh, Matthew, I'd love your thoughts on that first question as well. You know, what areas is that you see are critical to carbon reduction, but also also your thoughts on the fact that you are a frontline GP a couple of days a week. So, uh, you know, perhaps you can comment on Fiona's um, thoughts there about involving patients, which I'm sure is something uh, important to you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I'd love to pretend that this backdrop behind me is some Zoom or Teams thing. It's not, this is genuinely where I am at the moment. Um, <laughs> so as a GP, my real uh, interest is how can we decarbonize primary care? And it's only by knowing where the hotspots are, where our emissions are, can we even start to try and uh, tackle them. Um, and we, we can break primary care into sort of clinical and non-clinical. Both of them need different solutions. We can start breaking down the non-clinical care, how we run our practices into the hotspots of, of travel and energy, uh, procurement and business services. We then need a plan for each of those areas. And so actually we get smaller and smaller into more and more detail and then we can start doing something about it. So at the moment, um, I think that there are some people who know exactly what we need to achieve net zero in primary care within the next four years. I think that with the right willpower, we can use the, the technology and the innovations that have already taken place, and we could be there by 2025. The biggest barriers, I think, is probably the, uh, and I hate to say this, but it's the inertia of big organisations. I think that there are some who are very fleet of foot, very quick, very forward thinking. But then there's also all of these sort of committees that only meet three times a year and you have to go and get approval for this before you can get through to the next stage. So I think that I think that we could achieve it very quickly. And certainly the, the non carbon uh, the non-clinical part of uh, primary care, the expertise is already there. We, we have innovated over the last um, 18 months in terms of electronic consultations, in terms of doing things digi digitally. We, we heard about some of the um, COVID wards at home, as it were, so that the monitoring equipment is in the patient's home so that they can actually feed back some of their information. Patients monitoring their own blood pressure at home. This didn't happen a few years ago, but actually we've had patients today who've said exactly this is the problem. Um, and actually the patients, I think, are really, really important. I think almost every patient I've seen today has got an element of environmental sustainability um, within their um, uh, problem. So I had a chap who had a lot of moles. He wanted to know how to monitor them. So we were talking about how we can take photos, how we can monitor them, them himself. Um, we were talking uh, about things like green and respiratory care. So actually moving away from some of the high impact inhalers into um, and it's not just about changing one aspect of it it's looking at the whole big picture and saying for a respiratory patient actually we need to do things to stop them from getting ill in the first place 13 percent of asthma in globally is caused by traffic pollution how can we allow as a, as a nation as a society 13 percent of our patients to develop a disease because of our travel so actually it's not just the inhaler type and the propellant within it, but it's looking at the whole system. So for me, I'm very positive. Um, I think that there's lots of um, opportunities. I think that we can get there. We just need a bit of political will to, to overcome some of the hurdles. All right, so that sort of resonated with me, but just thinking back to the film that Canon showed and people cooking in Africa, you know, on a, a wooden fire. And they were saying that that's the equivalent for the, the people cooking out there of, of smoking two packets of cigarettes a day, as well as you know, the carbon emissions that it gives off. So we've learned some incredible things today. Dan, I'd like obviously to bring you into the conversation and uh, I'm just gonna give you a bit of free reign there because you've listened to Fiona, you've listened to Matthew and I'd love you to share your initial thoughts before we dig a bit deeper into offsetting and other aspects of our debate. Definitely, well, good afternoon. And I think uh, it feels like Fiona, Matthew and I are on the same page when it comes to the value of quantification um, and the systems that need to be in place to understand what impact we are making now and robust systems that can continue to track that and really give us a good, uh, a good measure of what the impacts of our innovative approaches are really having. Um, for, for us as a trust uh, and where I feel that the NHS is, is really well posed, um, is kind of enabling that innovation within our services and also inter and intra trusts um, to share that information, um, which can really, really help to 
speed up that adoption of best practice if you know an equal service um, who who have a, a, a similar set of responsibilities if they've tried something and it's worked um, that could be a really valuable way to to you know, speed up change um, equally is the case of uh, having open door processes um, to allow for these ideas um, these new strategies these new ways of doing things to get some support whether that's from me as a as a head of sustainability or from another manager um, that could support these changes um, that can be beneficial for not only workflows but can be beneficial for uh, economic efficiency and also the environmental in, uh, benefits that can in many cases follow on from that so I think like like Fiona and Matthew have said I think there's a there's a lot to look forward to um, and I think that uh, it's it's really amazing the work that's being done in this space and just just briefly Dan do, do you feel sort of frustrated that you know like like sort of Matthew said it's, it's I guess it's a bit like trying to to move the Queen Mary, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, jumping through all the red tape and all the layers that you have to go through for change. Do you feel frustrated sometimes that, you know, a lot of the innovations there and the wills there, but sometimes, you know, the NHS is a big un unwieldy sort of organization and, and it takes time to get things done? Definitely. Um, I, I think my, the experience that I've had so far is that it's, it's speaking different languages to different people. Um, so in some cases, you've got to speak in numbers um, for the finance department. In other cases, you've got to speak in uh, more practical terms. So, for example, what is the reality of swapping from desfluorane to sevofluorane, for example? Um, what are the actual impacts that has on the day-to-day -day operations that we have? So, yes, I, I, I do agree it is, it is a tricky task, um, but I also think that it's if given the size of many of the trusts, so for example, uh, Kent Community Health NHS Foundation Trust is one of the biggest uh, community trusts in, the, in, in England. So we have a, we have a responsibility there um, because the change that we can make within our walls can also be echoed in the uh, relationships that we have with other suppliers um, to really have change across the region and hopefully that change uh, continues. You do certainly have that opportunity with about 2 million people, uh, so the opportunity to make a big difference. Uh, Fiona, let's go back to you. Can we talk offsetting and, you know, what are your views on offsetting? Um, well, I, I guess uh, they're mixed. I mean, offsetting is often used by people to get out of jail free card. You know, you don't actually commit to reduce things. You use offsetting as a kind of way of greenwash. The reality, as we all know at the moment, is that actually there are some uh, emissions that you can't um, reduce. So offsetting has a role. I think, though, we need to think about the how we offset and what it's for. And I suppose, you know, you hear a lot about people committing to planting forests and all sorts of things, which is great. Um, we all know that there isn't enough land in the world to do all the offsetting we need to do. And so the bit that we do do right now, I think it's really important for us to think about how do we engage people, maybe our own staff, um, communities in offsetting. So if you're going to plant a forest, fantastic. But how are you doing that, as Cathy was mentioning, to create you know, be, maybe green jobs? or get people engaged in nature, which is also good for their health. Because I think one thread that's come out of our conversation so far is, you know, what's good for the planet also tends to be good for our health, uh, whether it's as you were reflecting clean cooking stoves or, you know, whether it's exercising and not, you know, not getting in the car for short journeys, that kind of thing. So I think there's something around the how we get the offsetting message to not just be about reducing emissions, but actually to think about how offsetting can be for health, whether it's engagement with nature or communities engaging in the activity. But I think it should be used positively. And I would say that, wouldn't I? But I think one of the great things that the health sector does, which not many others do in um, sustainability, is actually link to benefits, the so-called co-benefits approach. And I think that we should be you know, flying the flag for really pushing the health 
benefits of action. So I would like to see offsetting linked to health benefits and what we do, particularly around that nature-based solutions. But I'm sure we could extend that analogy to other things. You're right. And that sort of joining the dots is a theme that sort of emerged today that, you know, you can um, get a healthier nation by doing various yeah. things that are actually better for our planet too. Um, Matthew, your thoughts on offsetting. Is there evidence that it works? If so, are all sets equal? And it was interesting in some of the questions we got when we were talking about offsetting with Canon, there, there almost felt a slight irritation from some of our audience in that they perhaps felt offsetting was a bit of a greenwash. Uh, personally, I would absolutely agree. I have got a particularly poor view of uh, of offsetting. I think in the past, in centuries past, the rich and the powerful used to be able to pay the church to offset their sin. Um, so that that's how they got out of purgatory after they died. So <laughs> I think it's used by organisations, unfortunately, as a default. This is what we're going to do first. We're going to offset before we do anything else. And actually, that just enables sort of bad, polluted behaviour to, to continue. And it doesn't actually make any of the uh, the changes that are needed. Exactly as Fiona said, there isn't actually enough land in on the planet to offset uh, all of the different sectors that are currently polluting. So actually, we can't offset everything, even if it works. There was a, a report in the press um, earlier this week or last week, the million trees that have been pledged by, I think it was Abu Dhabi, somewhere in the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, a decade ago, huge fanfare, lots of photos. Actually, the majority of the trees have now died because they weren't looked after. It's not just planting, it's looking after. And I think part of it is about, we had the intention, it's a, and I think offsetting is a bit like, I want to lose weight, therefore I should get a gold star for having the intention to lose weight. But <laughs> actually, it should be the outcome. I want you to show me you have reduced your carbon emissions or that the trees actually have um, absorbed that tonne per tree or 40 tonnes or, or whatever amount you said it's going to do. I want to see the outcomes of it, not telling me, I will do this. Prove it to me. Show me the proof of the pudding. It's it's in the actual doing. Um, so personally, I've got a bit of a dim view about offsetting. I don't think it needs to behaviour change. I don't think I think it's just going to allow people to continue to do what they do um, and think that planting a few trees or some seagrass or <clears throat> some moorland is going to do um, a good job. And I, personally, I don't think that that's going to be the case. By all means, plant trees. But do it really because you want to improve nature and biodiversity and prevent the, the ecological disaster and the biodiversity disaster. Uh, don't do it because you think that in 40 years from now it's going to have um, taken up some carbon. We've seen the, 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 the fires in, uh, in Greece, for example. If any of those trees have been part of uh, an offsetting scheme, actually they've gone up in smoke, so actually they've generated carbon. Um, I don't see it as being an answer, I'm afraid. I can see Dan's going to add to that. And I was actually going to ask you, Dan, specifically about tree planting and what sort of role that can play, if you think it can. Certainly dead trees are no good to us as much. As much. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a good point. So I think tree planting in particular is one of the, a fairly easy way to get into the the offsetting carbon sequestration side of things. But yeah, I, I'm also very pessimistic. Um, in that uh, for any of these schemes, then I'll be, yeah, grabbing my glasses and be looking at everything with a, with a, with a careful, yeah, careful view, because really you've got to think about things when it comes to offsetting the trees, you've got to think about three things, um, which is really what, what are you doing? Uh, why are you doing it and how are you counting it? Um, so when it comes to what you're doing, so it's uh, right, what, what are you actually paying for? So you're paying for the seeds, you're paying for rent of the land, is the rent of the land and the care of the tree, for example, like Matthew was saying. Um, are you going to be paying that in perpetuity? Is, is the money that you're paying going to guarantee this tree is going to be there for the next X years? Uh, why are you doing it? So really it's a case of uh, can you justify that there is no other way? Um, so is it the, that you're you're lacking the budget um, and the budget would cover offsetting, but it won't cover actual change in processes, actual investment in, in efficiency? Um, and equally, are you, how are you counting it? Are you confident of your source? So do you, can you uh, be confident the numbers that you're, you're pulling together? Can you be confident that 
this tree is going to be there <laughs> for, for enough time to justify the figures that you're you're associating with planting it so i think uh yeah when it, when it comes to using trees for offsetting it's it's very complicated and i think it should be i think as um as as uh canon's associate that i had uh when it comes to i think it's co2 balance can't remember. um but the, what they're saying is uh sequestration and and um offsetting really is quite down in the priorities list really it needs to be a case of you, you cut it at the source you stop you stop it um before you look to try and make up for it after absolutely i'm going to move on in a moment fiona to innovation just to give you a heads up there but i'm just looking at the questions popping in on the side um and there's one here um for matthew so lee first of all says well said dr sawyer very important offsetting isn't the answer Thank you for writing in, Lee. Russell says, very interested in Matthew Sawyer's thoughts on how we can decarbonize in primary care. What's the base, best place stroke forum for sharing good practice and practical ideas, steps and actions? Uh, no, that's a brilliant question. And that I, I could have planted that question and talked to you for the next 24 hours straight on it. However, I won't. You ain't got 24 hours, Matthew. No, I know. <laughs> There's, there's a number of places, so uh, greenerpractice.co.uk is a group of uh, GPs and uh, people from primary care. The website will be updated tomorrow, that's my uh, to-do list. Um, Green Impact for Health is a scheme where um, primary care and GP practices can look at the different things that need to be done to achieve net zero. Uh, my website, csustainability.co.uk, there's lots of resources there. Um, there's about to be um, in due course a carbon calculator for, uh, for, for practices and a decarbonisation guide which will go through all of the steps that uh, a practice will need to take or could take, sort of a menu of ideas, um, and they then take the ones that are uh, best for them. So certainly in terms of forum, either email me or uh, Greener Practice, depending on uh, what your what your role is, um, and we'll we'll find ways to uh, uh, to make this happen. The other places uh, are the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. Um, have got a lot of resources and um, forum for different clinicians and people in different parts of healthcare to, be able to have ideas with each other. Uh, will Bailey is asking if we can provide links, so I'm sure our team yeah. will, and I'm sure they'll be on our website. Now, Fiona, let's talk about. The Sustainable Healthcare Coalition's approach to innovation and um, and perhaps some examples that you can share with us of innovation in practice. Yeah, well, I suppose, um, you know, our realisation is that you need to bring the system together because I think, as Matthew said, you can't do innovation in piecemeal bits. You need to think around the whole context of the system. And when we originally did our carbon footprinting on medicines and devices, what we realised is that that was great and needs to be done. And we need to see that in the context of the journey the patient takes across the system. So we need to be able to map that out to look at the opportunities at different points. So that's, you know, one of our realizations. I think it's also important that we bring together, as Cathy was suggesting, you know, manufacturers together with frontline staff, together with more strategy people in the NHS to look at how we design and shift the system. Because I think, you know, what we often do is talk amongst ourselves rather than bringing external people in who are actually producing the goods themselves. And I think one of the things that I've learned from chairing the coalition is that actually when you bring a manufacturer together with a clinician the clinician often have the brilliant ideas about what they want to do for a patient and why they think that you know we can change things and then that's a really good challenge to manufacturers because they do the best they can by understanding the system but until that challenge comes in so i think a lot of what we've learned about innovation is actually to bring the designer with the, with the customer, if you like, and then see the whole picture and recognize that sometimes we focus on the small things which we think we can change, whereas maybe there's a bigger thing in the system that would be more important to look at. So it's seeing the overall context. In terms of examples, I mean, I've mentioned the work that we've done with the Oxford Academic Health Sciences Network to apply our care pathway approach to quantify what we've done on preeclampsia. That's one example. I think digital has been a big thing. I've mentioned patients know best and quantifying their approach, but we've also looked at how digital approaches through apps for 
for inhalers, for example, can help parents with children manage their child's asthma better and can reduce the impact of um, hospital admissions by improving inhaler use, for example. We've had case studies that have shown that. We've also looked at how we can work with patients again through digital support before an operation, before, for example, they have a knee replacement and then afterwards to make sure they get the best rehabilitation and again that reduces impact so sometimes it is through the actual kit that you're using but sometimes it's through the process as well and i think digital is a great enabler um matthew's mentioned his approach to primary care and what he's doing and we're really pleased to be working with him at the moment on developing the primary care calculator because again we want open access materials and we you know again through our care pathway approach which is online the calculator where you can work out for yourself what your care pathway is doing um you know we really want to encourage that intervention and engagement between people to really come up with new ideas and i think from for me um what i've learned about innovation over the years is that people tend to think of it as being a very special process but i think as kathy pointed out it's often about changing the way we do the things we do every day rather than having to have some new snazzy bit of kit it's often actually thinking differently and i think at the heart of innovation is really the ability to experiment and play and I think sometimes what holds us back is actually that fear we're going to get things wrong. Um, and something I learned from working in industry is what they often do, particularly in digital around prototyping, where you come up with something very rapidly, which is really rough as guts, but works. And then you work out whether it's going to do the job. And then if it doesn't, you just jettison it. And I think one of the things that often happens, and I've been guilty of this in the past too, is that we get very emotionally attached to the things that we develop. And you know, part of you know um, innovation is actually to say we tried that, didn't work. It's fantastic because we've learnt this stuff. Let's go on and see what we can do next, and trying not to get too caught up with it being you know your thing, your your key um, pet project, because I think that can hold innovation back too. So I guess that's some of the things that um, we've learnt. But we're really open to collaborating with people and new ideas and. I think, you know, the thing that's really inspired me in the last 18 months during the pandemic is how many clinicians have come to us and they really find working on sustainability almost a release from what's been a really relentless time because it's people's passion. And I think if we can only bring people together and unlock that, we'll, we'll solve the problems um, because people want things to change. They really do. So I think we tend to think about you know, line, you know, big um, ships and lines being difficult to turn. Somebody once told me, actually, take, if you're a good um, clinic, a good um, driver of a ship, a pilot, a uh, captain, that you can turn it in less than a minute. So I think there are also some myths and we should be busting those and using people's enthusiasm to really um, bring about change. So I guess those, those are my thoughts on innovation and kind of what we've been doing, but also how I've been inspired by the people that we work with. I think we've definitely we've all learned I think to turn that ship much, much faster because we've all had to adapt in different ways over the last 18 months so definitely, definitely. being positive fear of failure is something that also came out in earlier discussions about innovation right. and uh, Vanessa just says Fiona that's a great idea Fiona bringing together consultants suppliers and frontline workers um Dan I know from reading um the background that you sent me that uh, one of your big passions in life is innovation. And from a sustainability perspective, what approaches can services take to embed innovation within operations? Sure. So I'm a big believer that it is necessity that is the mother of invention. Um, so where, uh, where we found, for example, that there wasn't a tool in place, um, that was kind of what we wanted to use going forward for measuring our uh, grade fleet mileage. Uh, being community trust, that's a big one for us, like 9 million miles um, in 2019, 2020. Um, so we made our own tool. Uh, so we coded it up in Python and then we used one of the Department for Health's, uh, Department of Transport's uh, APIs to figure out what our emissions are there. Uh, equally, uh, we're interested in in what are kind of the, the pulse of our buildings, I suppose you could, you could say. Um, so what we're doing is we're figuring out how we can get really high resolution monitoring um, without the the expense and downtime that can come with sub metering that, that many of you might have come across and there, there are solutions for that 
so I think when it comes to how we're approaching uh, innovation from a sustainability perspective, one of the big uh, projects that I'm driving at the moment is uh, it's it's an approach that is similar in ways to kind of uh, Ernesto Ciroli's kind of enterprise facilitation, um, which, it, which some of you might have come across, uh, which is that uh, me as a facilitator, um, so I can provide uh, ways for funding, contacts, all sorts. But what we need first is that that first step into the open office um, from a colleague that has that passion, that has that interest, has that drive, um, that can that can push these projects from from the ground. Um, because in many cases, so for example, in our case, I'm a I'm a team of one, uh, and I work across the entire. Like, the, the entire trust to, to push these projects. However, I can only do so much, um, but my time can be really well spent supporting people to do the, to, to yeah, push them, progress these projects that are important to them. I can give them all the tools that can help, um, but sometimes what I can't do is, is to be the person actually doing it. So that's, that is one of the key methods that we're, we're using to innovate kind of throughout services um, is to start off with this an open door policy if you've got if you'd like to see change uh, I'm here we're here uh, to support you in any way we can in to make that a reality I love the fact Matthew that two days a week you're a GP and then you run a sustainability consultancy because you're seeing sort of both sides and you can bring bring the two together which is is fantastic um, but I just wanted to move on we've only got about three and a half minutes left and I just wanted to talk about data and um, according to the NHS longer term plan, evidence, analysis, data underpin the targets um, for net zero emissions. Do we need to make sure, Matthew, that there's perhaps a unified approach, if you like, to collecting that data and making the best use of it? Absolutely. One of the problems with um, measuring carbon or measuring greenhouse gas emissions is it all depends on what you include or what you don't in include. So, for example, when you are on a diet, do you include that glass of wine? Do you include that chocolate bar when you were in the car? No, they, or do you include stuff that you have on a Sunday? And carbon <laughs> emissions are no different. That actually, so you may include, for example, travel. So the, the amount of petrol or diesel that is burnt. Did you include the amount of carbon to make the car or the vehicle? Did you include the amount that it cost in carbon terms to dispose of it? So it depends on what calculator you use as to what is included or excluded. So having a uniform approach for primary care, community care, secondary care would be fantastic so that we're all counting the same number of things. And we all know what we're including, what we're excluding, um, because otherwise one person says, oh, my calorie intake was a thousand today because I didn't include that muffin because it didn't have the number of calories on it. Well, no, that's not true. You've, you've miscalculated, you've misrepresented. So, yeah, a uniform approach would be fabulous. I'm going to take a final word from Fiona and a final word from Dan. It's going to be fairly brief, Fiona, but how will a greener NHS benefit patients, which are obviously at the very heart of our NHS service? Well, I think, as I said, if we design it well, then we can actually improve health services quality, reduce the cost, but also improve patient outcomes and also get their engagement, which we know is good for people's health. So I think there's a huge amount that we can do if we, work, we collaborate together with patients and they can also teach us how they can, we can bring sustainability into the health service, too. So I I see it as a really positive win-win, uh, you know, healthy people on a healthy planet. And as you said, we just need to keep joining the dots and showing people the practical first steps they can take. That's how I think we do it. And no pressure, Dan, but you've got uh, the last minute and the final word. And, you know, we started off um, this conference right at the beginning of the day talking about the, you know, our health service and our ambition to be the first in the world to be um, carbon neutral. Um, and I think 20, was it 2040? Is it 2040 is our aim, isn't it, now? We've brought that forward. Do you think that that is realistic and achievable? It, it has to be. Um, it's, it's very much the case as, uh, as NHS, as the NHS, then our priority is the patients that we look after. Um, and we understand, I'm sure many of you understand, that we don't need to care about plants and trees. We don't need to care about electric vehicles. But we do need to understand that the best way that we can continue to give healthcare the highest quality 
is by protecting the planet that we live in, uh, live on, um, in order to reduce lung disease, in order to reduce the impacts of climate change, in order to reduce both regional, national and global effects on health, um, which are going to just be exponential unless if we take the action which we are needing to take. So 2040 is, is, is a must. 2040 is a must. Final great words. Um, thank you to all of my panellists. You've been uh, brilliant. It's been a, a, a final and very interesting debate. So thank you very much for taking the time out of what I know are busy days um, for you to um, spend it with us. Thanks a lot. Your time's been really, really much appreciated. Um, and with that, we draw to a close on what I think has been a fantastic day of guests and delegates delegates networking across our NHE 365 platform, covering innovative solutions in our aim to become the first net zero national health service. As mentioned throughout, all of today's content will be available to view on demand within the platform at your leisure, and that'll be within the next 24 to 48 hours. And remember, our networking tools remain open year round with an ever growing community of registered innovators. I look forward to seeing many of you again back again for our future events we're hosting throughout the year. Perhaps bring some of your colleagues with you next time to our event covering virtual hospitals and technology enables care. That's taking place on October the 28th. If you're a winner in our gamification challenge, the NH NHE team will be in touch to discuss your prize options. Those in first, second and third on our leaderboard have the choice of three prizes, Amazon vouchers, a donation to a charity of choice, or dare I say it, the planting of an equivalent number of trees. Separate to gamification, today's event was CPD certified with one CPD point earned for every hour of live content watched. We'll collate this information and then distribute the CPD certificates. Before we go, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our brilliant team behind the scenes at National Health Executive, who really have worked tirelessly both today and in the run-up to ensure that we could put on such a great event with brilliant speakers and guests. And from me and everyone at NHE 365, thank you for attending today and giving us your time and attention. I hope you have a great evening and I hope I'll see many of you again soon. Thank you for having me.